All right, good evening. My name is Roger Erickson. I'm a warning coordination meteorologist for the National Air Resource in Lake Charles. And I've actually got two presentations that we're going to do tonight. One is called Advanced Skywarn. There's about 70 something slides in this one. We're going to be skipping over probably 20 of them because the second presentation I've got is basic radar interpretation. And so there's some overlap between the two. So I'll be, some of the ones I'll be skipping in here will be more applicable in a second presentation that we'll do. But still planning on getting this done in an hour-ish time frame between the two presentations. So the first one starts off with, you know, basically the review of what we've talked about in Skywarn from a month ago. Uh, severe thunderstorm detection, talking about weather satellites. The primary weather satellites across the United States goes east, goes west. Uh, this is a high resolution visible satellite imagery of some severe storms moving through the Plain States several years ago. This is the weather radar example. We talked about that as well. We're going to go in a lot more detail in the next presentation about the weather radar, but just a 3D analysis of some of the aspects that we're looking at. Uh, not only are we looking at what the reflectivity or the strength of the storm is in terms of these color codes that we're looking at and that you can look at as well on your phones and, and laptops and computers, but we're also looking at what it looks like three-dimensionally. Is it tilted uh, stacked vertically? Is it tilted vertically? Uh, some of those can be different features for us in the meteorology world to have a determination that this is a significant storm that could produce severe weather. So this slide here talks about the uh, lightning data. This is between 1989 and 99. Uh, Visela basically has the, uh, a series of lightning sensors all across the United States. And using triangulation method, they can show where lightning strikes occur. So this is not uh, lightning in the sky, cloud to cloud, cloud to, cloud to air, stuff like that. This is simply cloud to ground lightning over an 11 year period, 89 and 99. Uh, I've looked at other decades after that and you know it's all pretty much the same. I will say that the lightning frequency changes based on large scale patterns like El Nino and La Nina. Typically we do see more lightning during El Nino seasons, which we're going into now for down here in the Gulf Coast. But irregardless of that, when you look at it over a spread of a 10 year period, you can see that the highest lightning frequency is along the Gulf Coast, and it does include this section of South Central Louisiana where we are here. This is a picture that one of our former employees, he's a lead forecaster now in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, he got this photograph from, uh, I think, someone out here in the community that actually took the picture uh, up, up on I-49 near the, the uh, horse track back in the day, back in 2008. Does it look like a tornado to you? I mean, it does to me too. You know, I, uh, you know, it was a tornado that was on the ground. He changed the contrast on it to see it a little bit better, but uh, there was a lot of debate as to whether or not this thing was actually touching the ground or not. Even in a shot like this, with the, the fact that there's trees obscuring exactly what's going on, and you're not seeing debris coming up the, off the ground, it's one of these things, kind of a tough judgment call from simply looking at a photograph without us getting out in the community, driving out there to see what actually occurred. So the criteria, and we've talked about this in the past, of what we're looking for in a weather business, any kind of damage, whether it's from, a, a, you know, the winds, I should say, related trees down, property damage. If someone has an anemometer and they measure wind speeds over 50 knots or 58 miles an hour, that's the criteria for us. Hail, the, the criteria for us in terms of severe weather reporting is one inch, but we like to get any hail reports. If there's small, small hail, uh, quarter-inch hail, pea-sized hail, whatever. We, we like to hear, have those reports as well, uh, just because it helps us assess what we're looking at on the radar to know what's actually occurring in, in the community. Of course, tornadoes, flying clouds, flash flooding, or really any kind of flooding going on. And the, the last one I put down is snow, but really we're talking about any kind of winter weather, snow or ice. And P.S., during El Nino winters, which we're going into uh, here this fall and into the winter, the risk of Winter weather events like snowstorms, like ice storms, does increase along the Gulf Coast. So, not saying here, sitting here saying we're going to get an ice storm or anything like that, but it's something that will be at a higher risk for this season versus other years. Vice versa, that's the reason why we're looking at a quieter hurricane season because of El Nino. So, there's different factors related to El Nino that can adjust uh, overall patterns across different parts of the United States. This is uh, actually on the handout from the basic Skywarn class showing 
for the different wind speeds, what kind of damage you can, ex or not necessarily damage, but what the actual effects that you could see based on land. This, this wind scale originally started for things over the water, but this is adjusted for obviously things being over, over, over land. So when you're looking at trees and w exactly what's going on with the trees, we've got some different numbers associated with it. Hail sizes, you know, we always like when people are calling in the hail sizes to us, and honestly, it doesn't matter to us if someone says, hey, it's about the size of a dime. That's fine. You don't need to sit there and say it's 0.67. You know, we don't need you to go out there with a micrometer and measure the exact number for us. I mean, if, you know, if someone, uh, like in this case here over in Reeves a few years ago, uh, grabbed some, brought them inside, and had a, had a measuring stick to look at to show us, and then email it to us, that's cool too. Which, P.S., this storm here, uh, you know, the guy said it was like three and a half inch hail. And I was like, come on, we don't get three and a half inch hail down here <laughs> in South Louisiana. And he's like, I got a picture to prove it to you. And he emailed it to me. And so now I use it in my presentation. So, uh, you know, how big of a hail can we see down here? I mean, uh, you know, the four inch number is about the magic number that, I don't know if Ed, have you seen anything larger than that in this part of the country? I mean, it's very rare to get hail this large. Uh, and, and you can see what month it occurred. It was in March of 2009. I mean, you're not obviously going to see large hail in the summertime down here. Too much melting going on with the hot temperatures. But the season to get large hail, really large hail like that, would be in the springtime down here. And uh, safety tips, very briefly, we've talked about these before, but the, the, the big object with lightning is don't be the tallest object, don't stand underneath trees. Last week, we finally been, you know, we, here we are, we, we were in a wet, spring, a wet winter, and then it went bam, the water turned off and it's been dry for like two months here. And uh, in fact, it's kind of interesting, the phraseology, which I wasn't familiar with, they call it a flash drought. Have you ever heard of flash drought? I mean, I, I never heard of flash drought before, and the first email I got from our climate guys, they were telling me about this flash drought that South Louisiana was involved in. And I was like, what the heck is that? I mean, you know, we all saw our yards turning brown and stuff like that, so I mean, it's obviously that we've been dry for a while here, but uh, flash drought was first coined by climatologists back in 2000 in Texas and Oklahoma, and it's just referencing the time frame of how quickly you go from above normal to below normal for the rainfall. I mean, for the year, we're still running probably above normal here in Lafayette, but in terms of the last couple of months, you know, we're way, way below normal. So, uh, yeah, flash drought was a new phraseology that I learned about. Uh, <laughs> just last week with the storms that were coming in. I should say before the storms came in. But speaking of the storms, we had a storm up in Ball, Louisiana, up north of Alexandria and Pineville. Uh, a, the original report came in from a Skywarn observer up there, and she felt like the tr it was a tornado damage up in her community. Uh, her and her husband uh, run a, a, uh, a uh, graveyard up there in Ball. So I went up there to look at the damage and assess it, and we together, kind of concluded that it was actually straight line winds or microburst damage associated with two storms on, on one side of ball and the other side. And when the two of them were collapsing, it just created real strong winds. It just happened to be right here at this graveyard up there. But one of the interesting features, besides the wind damage that they had, was they, they, they had a, a pitcher, or I should say a, a tree up there that got their classic uh, shot of a, you know, it looks just like this lightning bolt. There was a pit, like it looks like someone drew it on the side of a tree. And uh, we walked out to it, and it was probably a, you know, I'd say a 30-foot tree. I'm not even positive what the name it, probably with an elm perhaps up there. Uh, and it, it went from the very, very top of the tree all the way down to the ground. And, and uh, there's markers next to it, grave, grave markers and whatnot. And I was looking to see if anything had gotten melted. Sometimes if there's metal on people's plaque, uh, you know, uh, stones and whatnot, that things can, can melt and whatnot. And nothing was damaged or, or done down there. But what was interesting was this tree was probably four feet from a large 80, 100 foot tall pine tree. And the pine tree was actually what got struck first because in the pine tree, you could see the lightning uh, bolt damage from the top of that tree coming all the way down. It went off the side of a branch and then it came down the second tree. So it was a flu you know, I guess a fluky looking picture. In fact, if you go to my Facebook page, I know you're, you're, you're friends with me on Facebook. I posted the pictures of the, the lightning pictures on there from last week. It's just an unusual uh, thing that you typically don't see. So lightning can definitely hit trees. We got a lot of stories about people dunking underneath trees. You know, they don't want to get wet and then lightning hits a tree and then they're struck by it as well. 
The other big point related to lightning is that it can strike pretty far away from where the rain's falling. So especially with the kind of rain showers that we've been having recently where there's nothing going on in one community and like in rain, it could be you know, flooding and all sorts of rain. There could be a storm and rain and lightning could strike over here in Lafayette. You know, that's a definite possibility in terms of how lightning works because some lightning comes out of the base of the clouds and other lightning comes out of the top of the clouds or the anvil section of the cloud. And when it does that, it can go very far away from where the rain is falling.